together manufacturing a ramp. I did a little five minute thing in class last time and bombed out with it. I've got 50 minutes to do it today, or less than that now. But I, I want to push you through it so we can get through the whole thing. I'm kind of glad that we're at the point we are right this minute in terms of your curiosity. I'm hoping that you want to know some things beyond what you know right now about manufacturing over here. Um, to give you an idea of what I'm going to try to accomplish um, is just what I said a second ago. Why do we do manufacturing overhead differently than the other two? I want to address it. I want to try to give some examples to show you how we do it. Here's the conclusion of it, but let's consider some other alternatives. And then what problems does it create when we do it this way? How are we going to solve those problems? And it's a whole package, and I'm hoping it will come together for you, OK? Um, it's partially from Monday's lecture notes. If you want to grab those Monday lecture notes and save you some note taking, it might be something you could pull off. I don't see that you have to write down every word on the screen. In fact, I hope you won't write down every word on the screen. I hope you'll allow me to embellish what's there and you to understand what it is that I'm trying to convey and you wouldn't spend a lot of time writing, you'd spend some time listening and thinking. Okay? I did accomplish in class last night time. I have said on more than one occasion, I think it's pretty easy to come up with the cost of the materials and the cost of labor in the finished product. We have to have all these materials. We, we can keep up with the hours that employees work. Those two are not our problem at the moment. The problem is all of these other miscellaneous costs that we incur are much more difficult to allocate to the products we produce. And we would like to get comparable results. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute when I try to show you why we're doing what we're doing and show you the consequences of not having comparable results. Let's talk about some ways we could possibly do this. So consider with me the one we mentioned in class last time. Let's say that this is the year that we're talking about, that it involves production. <coughs> and the first one on the list over there says actual cost at year end. I presented this one in class last time as the best, most accurate, reliable way to do this. Wait until the end of the year, sum all the cost, divide all the cost by all the units, and get a unit cost that would be consistent and comparable and accurate for one product, every product that we produce. It, 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 the, the problem with this one is it's not timely. It's old information. We could be selling the product all year long and selling it for less than the cost we incur, we can't wait all year long to know that information. You have really funny looks on your face right this minute. Why do you? Did you understand anything I just said? <coughs> Did you recognize that you heard it in class last time, or was that why you gave me the funny look? Because I've heard this before. You were the only class that I did that in, so I thought I'd do it one more time and try to set the stage because it's part of the whole story I'm trying to tell. So that's not a practical way to do it, even though it would be good, accurate results at the end. So I'm nixing that one. I'm saying, not going to work. Forget it. Well, usually if I open the floor to suggestions, somebody would say, perhaps some of your curiosity has been this week, why not just allocate the actual costs that we incur on a month to month basis? It's the next item on the list over there. That is perhaps the way we do materials. Maybe we do labor that way. Why can't we do overhead that way? And it's because of this unique group of costs that we're incurring and the way they behave that that doesn't work. 
Let me see if I can give you an illustration. What if in this particular month, the insurance bill arrives? And I allocate all the insurance cost to the goods I produce that month. There's no insurance in these goods. There's no insurance in all these goods I produce. There's only insurance cost that month. And the following month is just a regular month. And then the month after that, oh, well, let's talk about this just being a regular month. So your supervisor says, ooh, cost really went down this month. You deserve a big old pat on the back, maybe even a bonus. And then the next month, the property tax bill arrives and the unit cost of the product shoots way up again as you allocate all those costs to the production that month and you get fired. I mean, the pat on the back last week turned into a pink slip this week. You crazy idiot, how did you like allow costs to spin out of control like you did? Go with me here. When these are all just accounting things, nobody deserved to get fired over that, I don't think. So we need some way to smooth this out and see that every product has some insurance cost in it. And every product has some property taxes in it. And depreciation. And telephone. And electricity. And all those things. All right, think with me about this quick, crazy example. What about having two plants, I'm talking about comparing products from month to month, year to year, you can't see it very well, don't worry about it, it's a US map and has two cities, um, Bismarck and Brownsville. Pretend with me we've got a production facility in both of these. And here we are at the beginning of March, gathering together to have a board of directors meeting, the staff's been working hard to report results for us for the month of February. How do you think the plants in Bismarck and Brownsville are going to compare for the month of February? What do you know about Bismarck? It's going to be cold. They're going to have the heater turned way up and it's still going to be a teeth chattering kind of work with your coat on production. What do you all know about Brownsville? It's really nice. They probably got the windows propped open and they're all just whistling, enjoying, you know, birds are singing. They're just working up a storm. Well, how does that translate to utility cost? We're gonna spend a whole lot more in Bismarck for heating the plant than we are in Brownsville, don't you think? Can we compare the results, the performance in these two factories? No. Eliminate one, mentally. If you just had one of these facilities, could you compare the results of February with say, August. What do you know about Bismarck in August? They're gonna prop the windows open and whistle while they work. <laughs> Did I say Bismarck or Brownsville? You said Bismarck. Bismarck. Mm -hmm. What do y'all know about Brownsville in August? Hot. Hot. I don't think you can imagine how hot it's gonna be in Brownsville in August. <laughs> We're gonna turn the air conditioner up as fast as it'll go, full blast. And it's, we're still going to be sweating like fiends. Yes? yes? Can we compare the results of these two plants in February? No. August? No. One plant, February to August? No. Because these seasonal flux fluctuations are going to cause spikes and valleys in what we achieve if we use the fallacy actual cost on a month to month basis. And that's what you've been tempted to do. Oh yeah, this is the one I just finished talking about. A allocating actual cost on a month to month basis, the differences in the cost incurred, some of them seasonal, would distort the unit cost of the product that you produced. Would distort the unit cost. And my goal at the very beginning of this was to get comparable cost. Cost that we could use to make decisions that would be good information on which we can base decisions and these are not good ways to do it. So, what alternative do we have then but to consider perhaps the best of each of these? 
the good thing about the first proposal, waiting until the end of the year to know all the cost, was knowing all the cost. But we couldn't wait until the end of the year. So how about we put that at the beginning of the year? Let's have all the cost at the beginning of the year. Well, how can you know that? You got some crystal ball to look in to know what all the costs are going to be? It's an estimate. Let's estimate the cost at the beginning of the year based on our past performance, based on what we think we're going to produce this year. Let's estimate it. Is that an E? That's a summation. Uh, the sum. It's kind of got a little curve to it. Have you seen that symbol before? No. Never in your whole life? No. That's a crime chain model. <laughs> <laughs> Who has never seen this symbol before? <laughs> We're supposed to raise your hand. Oh, you saw it a minute ago, didn't you? So you have seen it before. That's summer. Um, it's an estimate. Now, let's think about how we're going to take all the cost of overhead and allocate them to the months, to the products that we produce. My suggestion is, let's divide by 12. Would it work to put the same amount of factory overhead cost in every month? Probably not. Yes or no? no? If I produce the same number of goods every month, this is a perfectly acceptable way to do it. If I produce a thousand units, 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 it'll work. What are the chances I'm going to produce a thousand units every month? I, I hope not very good. I think we should have a, a production budget that would dictate the amount that we need to produce. That's another topic, another day, another time. Let's take the total of all the costs that we estimate at the beginning of the year and divide it by something that will change as production changes. Let's divide it by a base, a driver. Something that changes as production changes. What I'm about to describe to you is called a predetermined overhead rate. And by the end of the week, you should be familiar with the term. By the end of this discussion, you ought to be more familiar with how to get it. That's where we're going. We want to divide by something that changes as production changes. So what you saw on the screen, formal, saw it here on the board, formally is estimated overhead for the whole year divided by an activity base, an activity driver with the keyword there being activity, an activity that will vary as production varies. Here's some simple questions for you. If I produce 500 units this month and 1,000 units next month, what's going to happen to direct materials? How much? In what proportion? I'm going to use twice as many materials. Agree? Mm -hmm. If I produce 500 units this month and 1,000 units next month, What's going to happen to labor? It's going to be twice as much, probably. Theoretically speaking, it would take twice as much labor to produce twice as many units. Well, that's the kind of thing we want to have here. We want to tie it to something that changes with output. There are three possibilities. We could tie it to direct labor for the same reason I just said. If labor changes, then the amount of overhead we apply to production changes. We could base it on labor hours. Labor dollars, labor, labor hours. Same rationale. I'm not going to take the time to explain which of these would be better or the circumstances that would dictate it right now. Or machine hours. If I produce 500 units this month and 1,000 units next month, how long is the machine going to run? Twice Say it's as twice as long. That's the point. So every month, as the level of production changes, the amount of overhead that we'll allocate in total will change. But as you divide, the answer by the number of units you produce will get a comparable unit cost from month to month. Then a manager can say, oh, it took you $3.80 last month to produce the product, and you did it this month for $3.75? Way to go. Pat on the back. 
took you three dollars and eighty cents to produce the product last month and it's three dollars and ninety cents this month what's going on do you see my point now we've got a comparable amount that we can use for decision purposes we can make this into a management thing now you're supposed to know by now that once you've determined the rate whatever you used as the denominator whatever you used as the driver you're looking for that actual activity that month if you tie this to direct labor then you multiply by direct labor that month if you tie this to the machine you multiply by that by the machine hours this month and I don't have to say the third one that becomes the estimate that becomes the basis for the journal entry that surely you know how to make by now. It is debit work in process, credit manufacturing overhead for the applied amount. Now, I got here a little late. This is Thursday. I wish you had heard that on Monday. It would have helped you in your homework for today. When you revisit that homework, that homework will make better sense, I think. It should. Let's see if we can't use some of what I just talked about today in the preparation of an exercise. Would you turn in your books with me to exercise 20-5? It's on page 896. 